Welcome everyone. So glad to have you all with us. And so excited to have you all joining us for our special Lunch and Learn, which is part of our Mi'kmaq Culture and Heritage series. We will be learning more about Mi'kmaq spirituality. And I wanna take this moment to invite you to take a deep breath, whatever has happened in the morning or through the week is over. Take a deep breath and arrive in the here and now. And I would like to begin but by acknowledging that I am in Mi'kma'ki. This is the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. Their inherent rights to this land were recognized in the peace and friendship treaties which Mi'kmaq, Wolastafiuk, and Passamaquiddy people signed with the British Crown from 1725 to 1779. This series of treaties did not surrender Indigenous land, resources, or sovereignty to the British Empire, but instead established rules for an ongoing relationship between multiple nations. The treaties were later reaffirmed by Canada in Section 35 of the Constitution Act in 1982, and they remain active to this day. I wanna invite each of you to join with me in this land acknowledgement by putting in the chat where you are joining us from. So for example, if you're in Cape Breton, you would write, I am joining from Unamagi. If you are not, aware of the Mi'kmaq or Indigenous names for where you are located, you can Google that. And it's an opportunity to learn as you join with us in acknowledging the land, the ancestral and unceded and unsurrendered land upon which each of us are located. The Nova Scotia College of Social Workers joins our members and our communities in the necessary labor of reconciliation. We are grateful to live and work together as treaty people in Mi'kma'ki. Take a moment for abundant gratitude to all of the elders and leaders and all of the indigenous advocates who have cared for and protected this land. Gratitude to the land itself. Without action, acknowledgements are empty. Whether you are with us in Mi'kma'ki or joining us from elsewhere, please consider whose territory you are in, your relationship with that land and your relationships with the Indigenous peoples who have lived and continue to live in that place. We invite you to reflect on how each of us, as individuals and as a collective body of social workers, can hold ourselves accountable to reconciliation with Indigenous peoples here and across Turtle Island. Thank you all. Special gratitude to Gerald Glode, Program Development Officer. And let's um, take this moment to really express our gratitude to Gerald. If you go to the bottom of your, um, your Zoom, uh, there you go. I see a little heart that's coming through. You should be able to see in reactions. So, Please join with us in this uh, gratitude to him for joining us and the Mi'kmaq Way Debert Cultural Center and the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq and Millbrook First Nation. So grateful to have him joining us yet again to share some of his wisdom and knowledge and insight so that we can be better and do better. And especially this topic is about Mi'kmaq spirituality. And as we affirm the land we're on, it's important for us to honor and commit to honoring the wisdom and reverence and traditions 
and spirituality that is connected to this land upon which we are. Just a reminder that this will meet your truth and reconciliation requirements for your annual professional development. We have um, a lot of videos and this is being recorded, so it will be available on YouTube within the next month or so. Um, but you can go to our website and find professional development videos um, on all of these topics and more. If you've already done your truth and reconciliation requirements, this will count towards just formal professional development. And with that, I am going to stop my screen share and turn it over to Gerald. Well, Lalin, so grateful to you for your wisdom and for teaching us. And thank you all for joining. Well, Lalin, well, all you. Well, thank you very much again for the invite. And uh, as we said, that uh, I do work for the Migmoy Divert Cultural Center as their um, program development officer. And um, this facility hasn't even been created yet. And my boss basically said, I don't want to build a building and build a box and just put things in it. Uh, what they wanted was all the programming developed first, uh, and then the exhibit designs based on the programming, and then the architecture based on the exhibit design. So we we're reverse engineering all this. And it's been 17 years of research in the making. And uh, myself, I uh, started off as a graphic artist. Um, one of the teachings of our, our people is, oops, Daisy, I can't turn my page. Let's try something else. Stop share, screen share, let's try that. Or one way to skin a cat. There we go. Uh, this here is just sort of me sitting there at my table reflecting on a year and all the different events. Um, Spirit is everywhere. And when it comes to spirituality, um, it's in everything we do. Uh, speaking to the elders, uh, they say that in a verb-based language, when you, when you speak or when you create something that is coming from like, you know, from your soul itself, uh, spirit is present. And just sort of sitting there doodling about the memories of the entire year and even being so engaged in just sort of that inner part of you where your spirit is you create things that you don't even know you did until you come out of it it's like you are so far down that rabbit hole that you're not consciously aware and being pulled out of this and looking at what i had created hours hours into it i noticed that center part that said wounded sky says it's too late i have no idea where that came from or why i wrote it it's just sort of appeared there and that's how deep that spirit of art can take you and um like i said uh spirituality is an amazing thing we do have a formal presentation and uh i was speaking to um um Suritsky before the presentation they're talking about Ella Paul and I'm like oh it's like uh, Ella Paul and I worked together on this presentation I don't know if Ella actually gave you this presentation on spirituality so I'm hoping that this is new to you but being from one of your co no, she, Ella did not <laughs> did not give us this presentation she encouraged us to reach out to you because oh. of your <laughs> All right, then. But so we do work with her closely. She um, has definitely been a great support to the Nova Scotia College of Social Workers. Excellent. And again, uh, this is something that we had worked on together, and I know that she's presented at different places. And um, so, yeah, I didn't want to steal her thunder, but we will share it. <laughs> and talking about the seven sacred teachings, this is basically how spirituality comes into your life is through your development. Um, when we talk about these seven sacred teachings that you receive, they usually come in intervals of seven years as you're growing. 
even looking at the periods that you're getting these different lessons from, like from your birth till you're seven years old, from your seven to your 14, from your 14 to 21, 21 to 28, these are all divisible by seven. And um, like you sort of believe that our life is broken into these seven stages of development as you come across them. And um, that final stage, the, um, the seventh teaching, it's, uh, go, it's infinite. And that's where I am as an old man, I'm still learning every day. And um, it's all part of who we are. And uh, just sharing these little gifts with you. Uh, the first sacred teaching, of course, is love. And love is the first sacred teaching because it's what you begin your life with. Uh, in order to survive as an infant, you must be uh, given love to survive. And uh, even created out of love itself. And um, true love comes from knowing the creator and knowing that you are part of the circle of life. It's, uh, some people even say that before we were life, we were spirit. And indigenous people believe that we actually had a process before we were born in choosing our parents. So that's part of our teachings too, is that that connection goes before you're actually a living life form, that even in the spirit world, you get to, um, enjoy things and uh, create your own uh, path in life. Uh, again, with love, um, always act in love. Uh, love the creator, love the earth, love yourself and your family and everybody. It's like, you know, your fellow human beings. And as we word, use the word human beings, that refers to life in the animal kingdom as well. Those are our beings that we share this planet with. It's not about just us. So when I say, and your fellow human beings, that goes into uh, the animal world and animal kingdom, as well as plants and the environment. Uh, the sacred teachings, like the, the second one is definitely honesty. Uh, you learn honesty as you grow from love, uh, to be true to yourself and to the creator. Children, for example, are usually very honest, uh, in some cases too honest. And some may argue, uh, but they see the world through love that they were given. And uh, yeah, that's very evident, uh, raising two children and now having two grandchildren. It's like seeing those kids and where they're coming from and the way that they think. I, I know that they've had nothing but love. Um, and again, the, the symbol for uh, honesty in our culture is the Bigfoot. And uh, the teachings are never lie or gossip, be honest with yourself and others, and speak from your heart and be true to your word. Uh, these are important teachings that you learn, like I said, in that second stage, like you know, from seven years old to 14 years old. And uh, that's where my little granddaughter is right now. And just seeing these things coming about, uh, it's a pretty amazing. Another sacred teaching, of course, is humility. Uh, you learn those from the time like you know, you're between 14 and 21. Uh, you realize that there's more to the world than just you and what you experience in it. And as a child, like as when you were growing, you often believe that they only believe in what exists and what they see. But for humility um, is achieved when you understand that the world works together as a unit to grow and maintain itself. It's like that interconnectedness of all the cycles. Once you start to realize that, okay, this is a machine and we're just a little cog in it. And um, we have to work together with a lot of other elements and uh, factors. Uh, again, with humility, you think of others before yourself and yourself, you uh, humble yourself to the um, great spirit by being thankful. And that's for everything and every little thing I know even with the um, lot of prayers through Christianity come at the end of the day where you give thanks for the things that you received. But in Mi'kmaq culture with the sunrise ceremony, you're actually given thanks at the beginning of the day for things that you are going to receive. You're very thankful before you even um, receive them. So there's a bit of a different process there. Uh, in the teenage years, once you've uh, achieved humility, you grow into learning and respect for the world around you. 
as well as your elders. He learned that no single being is more important than anyone else. And respecting the animals is a good uh, example because they were put here by the creator as well. So like, you know, you're no better than any of the animals that exist in the world with us. It's like, oh, they're here for a reason too. And they have like a purpose to be here. And even when uh, natives take the life of an animal for food, uh, we give an offering and prayer to that person, that animal spirit in respect. And uh, although you're taking its life, you know, you're taking that life to sustain yourself and they basically gift their life for you. And you have to honor that by giving them things. And I'm even the process of the, um, the youth hunters that get taken up into the Cape Breton Highlands, uh, these youth are designated hunters hunting for um, the Mi'kmaq elders who can't get out to do that anymore. And they're taught this. And usually you're taking um, tobacco and you're offering it to the animal or giving up its life for you. And I know even in the case of um, using the animals for your footwear, um, you honor that animal with a song and a dance. And the name of this song is called The Dance for Your New Shoes. <laughs> so there's, it goes very, very deep. And again, that symbol for respect is uh, the buffalo that we use, uh, respect for all life on our Mother Earth, uh, respect elders and the people of all races and the it's essential, um, that's the essential essence of uh, respect is to give it. It's like, um, that's, it's like I said, not about yourself. It's about everything and everybody around you. Uh, the fifth sacred teaching, of course, uh, when we talk about truth, uh, comes in your late teens, your early 20s for the most people. And the truth is being that you've experienced and seen the truth of these laws. You know that as truth, there's truth in love, honesty, humility, and respect. These are the things that make you understand who you are and your accountability for everything around you. It's becoming, not even realizing the cycle, but finally getting to that stage in life where you realize that um, you are, you're responsible for it and you have to contribute to it. It's like it doesn't work independently of you. Uh, it doesn't work to serve you. It's like whatever you do to it will ultimately come back to affect you. That's a big part about truth. <clears throat> and again, the symbol for truth is a turtle. And you know, always seek the truth. Uh, living the truth is living the seventh teaching. So we have the, another practice that talks about wisdom. And with this practice, um, you talk to a lot of different indigenous groups, and they have a lot of ones for it. One, like, you know, before you're achieving um, wisdom, you need to achieve. Uh, sort of bravery, some people call it patience. Uh, there's different names that different nations give this teaching, but we use patience uh, here in the East Coast. And again, that's something that you achieve before that final stage. And um, before um, wisdom, we must first learn patience. And unfortunately, some people get stuck on this truth and never achieve the seventh teaching. Patience is difficult to achieve and to do so. You must have a clear mind and a true spirit. Other uh, in Aboriginal groups encourage courage for this category. And courage, bravery, patience, they all fall in. But in the maritime practices, um, this is basically accepted as our sacred teaching number six. A uh, definite symbol of both bravery and courage and patience is the bear. And what you have to do is uh, listen to your heart because it takes courage to do what is right. And um, yeah, that's, uh, that's a very, very um, big gift to receive once you realize that. And you are very aware of these gifts and their presence in your life as you come to them. And it's sort of like uh, this sort of rite of passage as you pass from one stage to the next as you grow. Uh, spirituality is a very, very strong part of who you are and who you become and how you act on things uh, every day of your life. Um, that wisdom 
is something that can only be achieved once you stop looking for it. Uh, it is a natural progress. Uh, progression that demonstrates uh, the mastery of the prior six teachings. Uh, my own band, many people refer to themselves as elders, although they, they have not achieved these truths. Um, <laughs> and even taking that to a sort of a different level, I don't know if Ella Paul would, <laughs> would agree with my teaching here, but uh, one of the elders shared with me a little story and he said, we have two types of elders in our community. We have a lowercase e and we have a capital E. He said a capital E is someone who has wisdom and knowledge. He said a lowercase e, that's just an old fart. <laughs> so uh, again, it's like there's a lot of humor in our teachers. And when you talk about culture, uh, there's nothing more Mi'kmaq cultural than a sense of humor. Uh, you'll find a lot of that humor goes with spirit and as you get to know people, uh, that's a big part of who they are. And uh, I see, uh, for example, my grandfather was considered an elder because he was wise in the ways of hunting. Uh, anybody who wanted to learn from him, being old doesn't make you an elder. It's uh, the knowledge that you have and the knowledge that you achieve. Uh, I'm 63 years old and uh, I know elders that I hold in high regard that are only in their late 20s or 30s. It's like, it depends on the individual. And um, yeah, that honor is definitely given. Um, my father was a master hunter. Uh, he was a trapper as well. And yeah, that's how he provided for our family is um, through hunting and uh, fur bearing animals. And uh, he was well respected for his knowledge of the animal. So a lot of people came to him for advice. Again, that symbol of the beaver, everyone has a special gift. Show your wisdom by using your gift to build a, like a more peaceful world. And that's where wisdom comes in. Like, <clears throat> I think I shared with you before about um, the artistic ability. And I asked my father, like, where we got it? Did we get it from our mom or did we get it from our dad? And he said that you got it from the creator, so don't waste it. <laughs> So that's basically my little special gift. And uh, that's how I, how I share with it. Uh, even talking about the spirits in our culture, we've got legendary characters. Uh, this is um, a Puganajit, the god of winter. And it's also the Mi'kmaq name for the month of February because it is the hardest month. It's just sort of my depiction of this, uh, this character that we have from our culture. Um, there's spirit in amethyst. Amethyst is a very, very rare piece of uh, material, and it's given in a lot of cases as gifts because of the spiritual connection to um, this material, the stone itself. It has a, an energy that people feed from, and it's something that our culture holds like their own high regard for this, um, this very, very rare material that is created right here in Mi'kma'ki under certain uh, fault lines and in certain locations under special conditions. But again, there's spirit to that stone, there's spirit to our stories. Uh, this again is a Pugnajit, the god of winter. And even leaving that offer on, that offering on the first month of February, you're giving, you're setting your table. And if you've got a household of five, you set six plates. That six plate, that extra plate goes outside to honor the God of winter. And you're trying to appease him to make him happy. So he goes into sleep. So that way we get um, an early spring and uh, the end of winter. That's part of our teachings as well. Even the spirit that we have, not only with the elders, but the elders knowledge. Uh, this is a painting that I did called my grandmother's hands. And it's just learning from like, you know, the elders. Uh, watching, observing, it's like uh, getting all of their knowledge uh, because after they're gone, it's up to you to take those lessons and pass them on to the next generation. And even finding photographs of like, you know, when I say this is a picture of my mom, um, my mom is the little baby and cradled in my grandmother's arms and uh, my uncle. And all of these people are gone now, but <clears throat> spiritually they're still here. 
their teachings guide you and the memories of these people and the strength that they had is what they left behind. So that's carried on to me, uh, share with my wife, pass it on to our part of a legacy, the <clears throat> honoring and passing on of our spirituality. Uh, even my grandfather and the baskets that we do make. Um, I go into an antique store and you see these baskets hanging on the wall and you know that they were created by our people. And it's like some of those creations were done by my family. And you're wondering like, you know, is the spirit of my grandfather, uh, the sweat from his brow, like, you know, in the DNA of that very that basket. But just even knowing that my grandparents um, created baskets and uh, hopped the trains and went down to the city, <clears throat> Halifax, Dartmouth, Bedford, and to quote, uh, sell to the rich white people. <laughs> but again, that was the way of life, like you know, in the late 1800s, early 1900s for our, our family, even up until the 1960s. <laughs> But even collecting traditional things, this is my son Kyle, collecting um, Mayflowers and just not only taking them, but bundling them up into a little cone of um, birch bark to sell. And there's nothing more fragrant than the, um, that flower itself. A very delicate little flower, blossoms for a very, very short period of time, but there's nothing that smells any more beautiful. And when I see that and doing that now today, uh, you know, with your children and your grandchildren going out to pick Mayflowers, uh, that's a big spiritual part of sharing um, what I did as a child. Uh, even harvesting bark, it's like these lessons that were taught us and watching for the indicators in nature, how the firefly comes out and tells us now's the time that um, the ground is starting to suck up that moisture. It's like there's a spirit from the insect world that connects us to the natural world. It's like observing these cycles and patterns that take place in nature. That's a big part of spirituality is that cultural connection to the environment. Uh, that's why it's so strong for us to defend it. And when you see people like the water warriors and what they go through with a lot of industry, and a lot of um, sort of corporate uh, debates over where they can do certain things or what they can do to the environment, uh, something that we don't approve of because we know that it goes beyond the mighty dollar and that uh, the environment is not just ours to use and abuse. It's like there's other considerations that they don't think about. But again, harvesting that bark, uh, you see that in the background, the leaves don't have their, or the trees don't have their leaves yet. And uh, that piece of bark, uh, that comes off in a very, very nice plug all the way down into the core. Doesn't kill the tree. Uh, the tree's still alive, but you can take these material from it. And again, leaving an offering for the materials that you take. That's part of the respect for the tree and the spirituality of that tree. Uh, making everything from even birch bark flowers and uh, uh, for sale. That's part of the dugalum. That's how we sustain ourselves by making um, art from like natural materials. And there's that spiritual connection between the gifts that they offer and the art that we create to be gifted to someone else. Stories and legends are full of spirit. We talk about uh, the legends of Glooscap, those teachings go back thousands of years and we created what's called a cultural memory timeline that talk about these traditional teachings and to know that they go back so far in time and that they're still present today in our, our families, our culture, our communities, um, that there's a very strong part in connection to our spirit is knowing who you are as a nation. Uh, even when you take a look at our clan systems, the families that we came from, we have a grandmother clan system. It's a maternal clan system. It's not a paternal like we have today. 
Uh, today, the wife marries the man. She takes on the name of the um, husband and the children bear the name of the father. It's like back in the day, it was the woman who produced the children. So it was under her clan system or from her family lineage that our spirit sort of flowed. And when we talk about our grandmother clan system, uh, we talk about the six worlds, the six worlds of our creation. We talk about the world underwater, the world underground. We talk about the world on the ground. We talk about the world above the ground, but below the treetops. We talk about the sky world. And the last world is the spirit world. And that's who we are as Mi'kmaq people here in our Mi'kmaq nation is this is me. I'm a glode, I'm a gluck, I'm a wolf fish, and I come from the water world. Uh, people in our culture, they know who they are. They know who they descend from. It's like that's a part of the spirituality that goes unspoken and unseen. You can go through any Aboriginal community. You're not going to see that connection until you actually talk to the people. Uh, the Johnsons, they come from the world underground. Uh, the Bernards, they come from the world on the ground. Uh, Mimi Gedge, above the ground but below the treetops. That's where butterflies flutter. That's where spiders spin their webs. Uh, that's where the squirrel clan runs through the branches of the trees. It's like these are all part of our spirits of our family. Uh, Benoit, the sky world, the eagle clan, Gitbo clan. Benoit's, Benoit's, Benoit's. It's like there's many interpretations and versions of this family clan. Uh, when it comes to the spirit world, uh, we talk about the spirits of the environment all around us. And then looking at that painting again with the landscape that is full of the spirits of all of these um, characters that we find in nature. Uh, there is a definite cultural connection to this. And even seeing this little painting here where you get some rocks rolling or some water rolling over the rocks in the form of a waterfall, uh, you go to a waterfall and you feel spirit there. It's like uh, they talk about the ions that are given off. Uh, there are negative ions that are given off by waterfalls, but your body collects them and absorbs them as positive energy. And there's so many benefits just from going to a sacred site. And when you go to a waterfall, you feel the, this presence. It's like, you know, there's a calmness. It's like, It'll drop your blood pressure. It'll, it'll make you feel good. It's like being in a happy place. And uh, that's what my wife and I do. Um, she definitely dragged me off to my first one and even my first hundred waterfall. So uh, that's a big part of our spirituality is connecting to uh, nature. <clears throat> Taking a look at that spirit world again. Uh, Paul clan is bone clan. And when I say bone clan, I'm not talking about the dog bone. <laughs> I'm talking about the spirit behind the dog. And you see a set of eyes, nose and mouth and chin. You see the shoulders and arm, as well as something even cradled in the arm with a hand. And uh, I painted this little picture over that photograph. Just to highlight the character that is in there. We have so many spirits in the spirit world. Uh, we have wick a lot of moods, we have wood a lot of moods, we have put a lot of moods, put a lot of moods, kadaga mooj. You're hearing mooj in all of the words and a verb based language, mooj means spirit. And whether the prefix is one of the elements, it's like water spirits, stone spirits, uh, wood spirits, uh, like your know, spirits of the environment, uh, just everything that we have is presence there. And knowing that there is presence whenever you're out there, you're, you're never alone. You're always with the spirits of um, someone else who has either been there or even a tree. It's like, you know, uh, you, you look up into the mountains and you see a tree and you see the boughs of a tree fold out. Now, during high winds and heavy storms, those tree will bring these branches in, you know, protect himself a little and make himself more sturdier for the wind. I mean, that's an indicator for the Mi'kmaqs knowing that there's an oncoming storm. It's like the trees tell you, it's like, you know, it's like that spirit of them and what they know and what they do and how we observe and learn from them 
as well as their spirit. Uh, spirit in our language, uh, verb-based language, breaking words up and the seeing how and why they're created. I take this to a lot of the students in the classes that I teach and talk about Naji Puktak Nij. Naji Puktak Nij is an animal that we live with here in Nova Scotia. Naji and Nij are almost the same thing. Naji basically means dark and Nij means night. So Naji and Nij are very close. Puk is the color, it's the color of ashes or soot and tuck means basically going out hunting for food. So when I ask the kids to think about nocturnal animals and it's like, what animal do you know here in Nova Scotia that goes out after dark into the night to hunt for food? And he's the color of ashes or soot. I think it's throwing a lot of nocturnal animals at me, whether it be coyotes, wolves, or um, owls. And then some little student in there is going to say, bat. It's like, yeah, that's the Mi'kmaq word for bat. And that's how bat got his name, Naji Puktak Nij. And it's like these words, they have spirit, they have meaning. They take that word as a, like, you know, it's not a noun. Uh, verb takes it to a whole new level of understanding. And that's the animal that does that. It's like we talk about our clans, the Knockwood family. Uh, that's Moon. That's the bear clan. Uh, they share that clan with the Syllaboy family. And the Syllaboys are also recognized as bear clan members. But even knowing that, where that animal got his name, he got his name from a basket that we make called the Muinani. And a muinanik is a harvester's basket or a berry picker's basket. And so Bear got his name Moon, which basically coming from muinanik is Moon is the one that picks berries. So that's how that Bear got his name for the practices that he teaches and shows us. Uh, Phillips is um, a bigamuj, that's the rabbit clan. And even when you take a look at the word, of, like a uh, obligamuj, and you look at that rabbit, you're thinking, well, he's got big ears, he's got big eyes, he's got big back feet and a puppy tail, he's got a split or a cleft lip. But when you look at that word obligamuj, obligamuj means uh, the one that bounces for short distances. And you see this rabbit in the woods, and it's like, pop, 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 pop. <laughs> so it's like, that's more of a, a descriptive, um, a description of his behavioral characteristic than a physical characteristic. So it really gets you thinking of the words and the spirit of the words. Uh, these, these words were gifted to us by the ancestors. It's like the people who were, who were here before us, they're the ones who established our language and created these words that we use every day. Uh, Wabas is a white rabbit, and that's the stage in life when it's safe to eat. Uh, you get a brown rabbit in the summertime, he's full of fleas and full of ticks and full of worms. It's like, uh, it's not a good thing to deal with. Uh, it can cause a lot of problems. But when he's wabas, when he's white, uh, then it's safe to handle and safe to eat. Peju, peju is cod. And in the Mi'kmaq verb-based language, uh, peju translates into the one that comes to the light. And again, that's how we harvest it. You take bonfires or torches out to the water and this fish comes right in and then you just harvest them. It's uh, part of their nature, part of their spirit and that connection that we have with them is through light and light-based technology. It's like, um, yeah, we put a campfire here and the fish come right in and that's the cod. We got squirrels, that's the young family and he looks a lot like another relative that we have and that's the chipmunk. But when you look at the Mi'kmaq word for chickmunk and you see A-M-A-L at the very, very front of the word, that there is the key. That talks about a decoration. Uh, squirrel does not have any colors on his back. But when you say the word chickmunk in Mi'kmaq, you're saying the one with decorated back, the stripes and lines on his back. And what makes a chipmunk different from a squirrel. And uh, decorated back. Uh, and again, when you take a look at uh, raccoon and you see the A-M-A-L again, that's the one with decorated eyes. So it's, uh, and even the name that we give some people, <laughs> one with decorated eyes. 
but all like I said there there is definitely spirit and everything and language is a big part of our culture uh gobit the beaver gobit means the one that cuts down trees uh we even have a little insect that is called the gobit edge it's a sow beetle or a wood lice and that's a little one so as you say g jury like the gobit edge it's like it's a small one it's a little one that um cuts down trees. So he, he takes the name of the beaver as well and uh, does the same thing. You find them under rotten logs all the time and decay in the wood. Gugus are Guguguess. They almost kept the original name. Uh, the Gugu clan is the owl clan and Guguguess, uh, it goes after the song that they sing, the hoo hoo. It's uh, the one that makes that sound, hoo hoo. Uh, the same with the the gobit and the gobit edge, we've got an insect that's a little version of the owl. So Guguguess for owl is Guguguess jeej, which is like a, a small owl. And that's what a moth gets his name. Because when you think of that big round head and little short body and the bold wide wings, uh, a moth definitely looks like a teeny tiny miniature owl. And uh, that's how he got his name. So the spirit that our ancestors thought of when they looked at these ones. Uh, crow is the same thing. It's like that kaka witch. It's like, that's the one that makes that sound. Kaka. Ka. It's like, so there's distinctive ones. Uh, another one is a chickadee. Uh, Europeans came over here. They had a connection with that same bird and they found that bird over here in uh, Canada. And uh, they called it a chickadee. Now uh, we had a Mi'kmaq word for that very same bird, but it's Chikiki with a J, Chikiki. And so again, there was both uh, that little bird in Europe and in um, North America were named after the song that it's in. Wiseot, that's and uh, talking about the Wiseot family, that's their clan symbol. And Bakhtasim is a word that's shared for wolf and coyote. And uh, Bakhtasim means the one that echoes. When you hear the howling of the wolf or the howling of a coyote, those are the Joni animals that do that. So that's how he got his name. Uh, Olmuj, that's a domestic dog, which is basically half fox, half coyote. And when you take a look uh, culturally, through some of the paintings that these ethnographers done. These paintings are done from the 1700s, and that was before photography existed. So the people who were doing exploration in North America come across this tribe of people. They in, employed ethnographic artists, and these ethnographic artists painted pictures of what they saw. And in the pictures is um, their domesticated dogs. You see they got a little white tip, just like a fox and their legs and underbelly are white, just like a fox, but his body is built more like a coyote. So a oh, Tyler, um, they were great for hunting and that's what we use them for. There's even other depictions here. You see another one right there in the very lower part, right smack dab in the middle, uh, that same domestic dog that we have. Olmoj, the domestic dog, means the one that goes home. It's like uh, a dog will mark its uh, territory by rubbing himself up there and leaving pieces of its fur, or leaving pieces of its scent, or unfortunately, maybe even spraying to leave his scent. But that's what Olmuj is, is the one that goes home. Uh, Pullets, that's the partridge clan. The, plow, uh, the plowage is the partridge clan, which is referred to as the pullets. Uh, we didn't have domestic uh, chickens laying eggs for us every day. Uh, we basically had our own version of it. When the Europeans first came over with their domestic chickens, uh, we were calling them Wenich Plowich, which means that's a French partridge. And uh, the partridge clan became the Poulet clan. And uh, that's actually a ruffle gross, so that's uh, more their symbol. But again, a lot of these French names, they came to us through the missionaries that we first came into. They're the ones who gave us Christian names back in 1610 was when the first Mi'kmaq were um, baptized into Christianity. And that life that we had before 
Christianity became the way of life that we lead now. Now, the Europeans were talking about a holy trinity of um, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and talked about the Creator Himself, uh, God, and the Son of God being sent here to teach us. And we are saying, well, we have the same thing. It's like you have different words for different things. And when you talk about your spirituality, it's the same as ours. We've got Gazul, we've got Niskam, and we've got Gluskap, who is the son of the creator sent here for us to teach. Even our story talks about Gluskap's teachings and how he left our people saying that he was going to return in our time of need. And we're like, there's so many parallels to Christianity that um, the Mi'kmaq went very, very willing in 1610 into Christianity because they believed there was one and the same. It, well, religion is basically uh, denominational that sort of sits in a little box with their teachings. But true spirituality, it's like, you know, you can see the um, relationships between everybody's culture and how they all have the same message and same teaching. So that's what we talk about here as Mi'kmaq people. It's not so much just the um, religion of the um, culture itself, uh, like Christianity. Um, I know there's a lot of Baha'i in the um, Mi'kmaq culture. Uh, it's sort of growing in our um, contemporary times. But uh, people, they practice both. It's like they practice um, contemporary religions as they were offered, as well as their traditional teachings. And uh, that's something that I see in every community that I go to. And again, when you talk about those signatories of those treaties from the covenant chain of treaties, um, they basically sign their name with an illustration of their clan symbol. Uh, you see between all the John Henrys and John Hancocks and uh, right in the middle, you see Sagama. Sagama is chief. And then there's an illustration of the chief that basically represented. I think this illustration here is a treaty from um, 1685. 1685, one of the first treaties. These ones are from 1727. And again, this is with the Wabanaki Confederacy because you can see like, you know, the Lieutenant Governor of New Hampshire, uh, Lieutenant Governor of Massachusetts, so this is going beyond Mi'kma'ki. It's going into Penobscot, past Maquoddy. It's like uh, there's a lot of other nations that were involved and the chiefs that represented these treaties uh, way back in 1727. And uh, you see the image of itself of Digby Gut and Digby Neck. It's like, you know, this was uh, something that was signed down in Annapolis Royal, which was uh, a gathering place at one of the earlier ports. and. Uh, yeah, this document is, uh, yeah, it's pretty important to the spirit of our people today. And finishing all that off, I, I did a painting for my um, boss when his uh, last daughter was born. And instead of grandparents, I called it clan parents and talks about the two grandmothers that this child has and the two grandfathers that this child has. And they come from the Martin clan, the Google clan, the Bernard clan, and the Most clan, the Johnsons. Uh, Bernard, even the word Bernard, um, the French word for Bernard is Renard, and the word Bernard derived from the name for Fox clan, which is the Renard or the Bernard clan. And uh, yeah, we don't have an R in our culture. So this again was given to us by Europeans. Uh, when you look at a Mi'kmaq word, uh, you, as soon as you see an R in it, you know that that's west of the St. John River. Uh, the Penobscot, Passamaquoddy, uh, Wa uh, Wabanagan people, uh, they used an R in their language. Uh, for example, the Mi'kmaq from uh, Maine, uh, they come from the Aroostook Nation. You hear that hard R. That's like Mi'kmaq here in Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, it's like we don't have an R. Then you get a little bit, even when uh, you're talking about the Gaspé Peninsula of Quebec, uh, there's Mi'kmaq nations up there. Some of their words have been absorbed from their neighboring culture, like the Iroquois or the Mohawks. 
and you may see an R in Quebec's Mi'kmaq language, but but not here. <laughs> so that's what I'm going to uh, end with today. And I uh, thank you very much for listening in on spirituality. And I don't know if I'll stop sharing and whether we had any times. I see one question in the Q and A, but uh, yeah, I'll stop sharing. There. Thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. Uh, so the first question that I see is, why is the treaty document red with yellow writing? Oh, it's actually um, a blueprint that was taken off. They didn't have photocopiers in the day. And even doing blueprints of it, the, the documents that they're on are basically uh, etched and uh, like a sort of an alcohol base. And there's like a, a certain type of paper that they use. And these are just photographs of these old documents. And um, I don't know if they've been enhanced or anything, but yeah, they're not originally like that. It's just the way things were photocopied before photocopiers was um, through the um, blueprint process. Thank you. And one of them is blue. The other one is sort of a, like a sepia or a brownie orange kind of thing, like a brick red or something. But, but yeah, it's just... Yeah, before four copies, they could still duplicate things. Another question that came up um, is, what is the difference between an elder and a knowledge keeper? Oh, knowledge keepers are um, just another name for the an elder. They can be used sort of um, like you know, uh, interchangeably easily, uh, but it is that knowledge base that um, that status is given the elder. And, um, and the cool thing was um, every treaty day, um, the Grand Council um, honors a person in our community as the sort of elder of the year. And that's along with the um, treaty day committee. And uh, this year um, I was the recipient. So that's kind of cool. So sort of elder of the year, that's pretty cool. That's but again, awesome. it's just for like, you know, sharing your knowledge and doing things on behalf of the Mi'kmaq culture that, uh, that they give you this, this honor. So yeah, and Treaty Day, we had, of course, Hurricane Fiona hit us and that, that little designation was delayed about a month and a half. So I just actually received it. <laughs> well, hopefully you can see all of the clapping hands and hearts that are coming your way. Um, oh. A lot of people are expressing their gratitude in the chat. Um, in terms of other questions, there was um, another question. If you could share a little bit about you had mentioned tobacco, um, mm -hmm. used and if you could share a little bit about the significance of tobacco. Sure, tobacco is one of our four sacred plants, and again, they're used as offerings for different things. Tobacco is offered as a gift. You've got um, cedar. Cedar is used usually around fire ceremonies and um, cedar is used as a, uh, it initiates um, conversation. And when you've got cedar and you've got cedar oil inside the bark or cedar oil inside the needles of it, when you put it in a fire, this stuff seeps out and all you hear is, you hear whispering, you hear voices. And sometimes you can interpret the sizzling of these oils. It's a communication offering, is what it is. And um, said tobacco, cedar, sweet grass. Sweet grass is definitely for the purification process. And uh, sage is sort of like that. Um, what is sage? Sage. Sage is something that uh, we use. We, we use it as a purifier as well as sweetgrass, but there's an element of um, um, cleansing, I guess, that uh, getting rid of bad things or negative energy. So the four sacred plants that we do have and for spiritual use are tobacco, sage, cedar, and sweetgrass. And uh, yeah, they're used to sometimes mostly in a mix. Like my, my offering bag has all four of them in there. And I've got a little pouch. And if I'm out gathering stones, gathering rocks, you definitely leave an offering. So it's an important part. 
a lot of um, gratitude coming in, uh, both for you, what you've shared, as well as for your artwork, and um, a lot of people sharing that this has nourished them spiritually as well. So um, thank you so much. Um, the one question that came to me privately <clears throat> that I wanted to ask on behalf is, when did the transition from uh, matriarchal to um, patriarchal clan or is it still matriarchal clan um in uh Mi'kmaq communities no people all they they recognize it and they know that it was once maternal but today the after paternal that that would have been after christianity of course and that first baptized uh, Mi'kmaq were 1610 uh we just celebrate the 100th anniversary there or the 400th anniversary in 2010 and uh, we even did a presentation to Queen Elizabeth and her husband, uh, um, Duke of Edinburgh, Philip, and uh, at that gathering. And um, yeah, so I'd say that's basically where it changed from the old traditional Mi'kmaq way to the um, Christian uh, way of doing things. So it had a lot to do with the church. Got it. Thank you. Well, Lalin, um, we'll all you to everyone joining us and uh, we look forward to your next presentation. Um, yeah. So everyone just uh, stay tuned. Make sure you're getting our emails and linking us on our social media because that's how we try to let you all know about all of the exciting professional development that's coming up in January. Um, and uh, here's um, gratitude again. Your art is so touching and captivating. Love this presentation as much as the ones you had already shared and learned more again and looking forward to learning from you. So I think oh, that that is a great comment to end on and with abundant gratitude to everyone, have a wonderful day. Thank you Thanks. so much. You too. Thank you very much.